Hello, my name is Keith Burrows, and I'm the Low Carbon Buildings Manager for the Atmospheric Fund. And my name is Caitlin. I'm the Energy and IEQ Research Coordinator for the Atmospheric Fund. So welcome to our re-recording of the Developing Energy Retrofit Programs for Scale webinar. We've seen a lot of requests for a recording of the webinar, uh, so we decided to recreate it without the Q&A section. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Atmospheric Fund, or TAF as we're known, we're a regional climate agency that invests in low carbon solutions in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, and we help scale up those solutions for broad implementation. We're going to speak to you about a TAF-led retrofit of seven Toronto community housing buildings and how the lessons we've learned from this and other TAF retrofits can be used to develop retrofit programs for scale. Here's a little bit more detail on the agenda. Um, we'll provide some context for retrofit programs that can scale. We'll talk a little bit about TAF's approach to retrofits. Um, we'll discuss specifically the retrofit of the seven Toronto community housing buildings. Caitlin will speak to that. Uh, we'll come back with some retrofit program recommendations. Um, and uh, in this particular rebroadcast, we won't be doing a Q&A section, so we'll just end it there. So let's start by providing a little context and discuss the need for building successful retrofit programs. So municipalities locally and around the globe are declaring climate emergencies. In fact, an emergency has been declared in every region in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area in, in the GTHA. And these declarations include targets like Toronto's goal to have all existing buildings retrofitted by 2050 and Mississauga's long-term vision of becoming a net zero community. In order to reach these goals, municipalities are looking to design and support retrofit programming, which can be used to increase the pace, the scale, and the ease of retrofitting our existing building stock. But it's not always easy to know where to start. But start we must. We have to get new programs launched. In order to meet the 2050 emission reduction target in the GTHA alone, TAF estimates that building emissions must come down by at least 70% from where they are today. And even with this deep emission reduction, we'd still be left with six megatons of emissions that we'll need to deal with uh, either through offsets or, or some other approach. In terms of pace, if we look at the multi-residential sector, um, this means we need to do deep retrofits of at least 31,000 suites per year through 2050 if we want to address every suite in the GTHA. And of course, that assumes a straight line linear path, which we know is not going to be the path that we'll follow. We're going to just start slow and have to ramp up over time. And then reducing emissions by 70% means not only do we need to dramatically reduce energy consumption at the building, we also have to electrify heating while simultaneously decarbonizing the grid. And in order to do this, we need sustained and predictable retrofit programs that are flexible and minimize barriers to participation. Okay, so our approach to retrofits. Uh, the Toronto Community Housing Retrofit that Caitlin will describe it followed an approach that TAF has developed over the last decade of work on retrofits of various size and complexity. And some of the things that we do in order to encourage participation for building owners, we minimize the perceived project complexity and pain uh, for the owner as much as possible by centralizing and encapsulating services. We also ensure retrofit performance through a robust m &V, and we provide a full year of post-retrofit optimization commissioning where we make sure that the equipment is performing as expected. We provide flexible financing options like energy savings performance agreements uh, and low interest loans with flexible terms and grant funding. And we use integrated project delivery for our project, for our retrofit projects. We found that the improved outcomes are worth any extra time that it might take to deliver the project. Uh, Caitlin will describe this in more detail, um, but when, the way I like to think about this, it's like an integrated design process, but applied for the entire project where you have a multidisciplinary group uh, team that's working on the project together from initiation to completion. We also focus on and measure carbon emissions while intentionally multi-solving for additional benefits like job creation, improved public health, improved indoor environmental quality, and increased resilience. And we're now aiming for deep energy retrofits with emissions reductions of 40% or more. If we're not able to get there for because of budget constraints or some other project constraint, we make sure that the work we do does align with a long-term retrofit plan for the building. We want to avoid stranded assets or installing equipment that won't perform optimally as the building is improved over time. 
with that, I'll hand it over to Caitlin to discuss the retrofit program, we, the retrofit project we did with Toronto Community Housing, and then I'll come back to discuss how the lessons we've learned doing retrofits can inform uh, future retrofit programs. Great. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Um, so yeah, I'll just dive into the um, project details. So in 2015, TAF partnered with Toronto Community Housing to undertake retrofits in seven buildings across three sites in uh, Toronto. The retrofits would target all three utilities, electricity, gas, and water, and would serve as demonstration projects for a better understanding of the potential for building energy retrofits. The buildings chosen were typical of existing building stock within Toronto. They are built between the 1960s to 1970s, and they range from a mid-rise seniors complex at four stories to a high-rise family building at 19 stories. Uh, if you want more details about the buildings themselves, you can find the case studies published on our website, which is taf.ca. And so I just want to take a look at the project goals. So these goals were developed together with the building owner, and they also reflect TAF's mission. Uh, first goal being 30% emissions reductions uh, across the portfolio, a 20% utility cost reduction, and then significant indoor environmental quality or IEQ improvements. So for those who aren't familiar, indoor environmental quality includes things like how comfortable the indoor temperatures are, how humid it is, access to fresh air and lack of odors, lighting quality, etc. And while this is already a lot to balance, we wanted to do all of this with a commercially viable payback that was acceptable both to us and to the building owner. So our fourth goal was to do everything above for under $5,000 per suite. To do this, we had to be really creative in our prioritization of the measures um, and how we put these things in place. It also took a lot of careful design and a holistic approach to energy efficiency retrofits. So how did we do this? Uh, we took an approach called Integrated Project Delivery or IPD. It's a process that collaboratively harnesses the talents and insights of all participants in order to optimize project results, increase value to the client and maximize efficiencies in all stages from design to construction and beyond. We find this approach beneficial for a number of reasons. So it helps streamline the project. We were able to reduce the number of requests for proposals needed from 27 down to one for the entire seven building project. Also, it lessened the burden on building owners. The administrative process can be reduced through partnership and it brings all parties together early on in the design process. So this helps the team take a holistic approach from day one, maximizing project outcomes. And all of these things ultimately lead to enhanced cost savings. Some key points I really wanted to stress here, um, the retrofit, retrofit program designers should understand that integrated project delivery requires time and collaboration. However, it significantly strengthens the project outcomes. Required timelines for applications and funding should build in ample time for integrated project delivery. And spending timelines also need to be adjusted to reflect actual project timelines. In some cases, we've seen spending timelines of six months, which doesn't allow for critical thinking and the holistic design process that we need to see in order to make significant emission reductions um, and see cost savings. So one more thing I wanted to touch on was our approach to financing. We leverage a specific financing tool called an Energy Savings Performance Agreement, or ESPA. Under this type of agreement, the building owner doesn't pay for the upfront capital costs of the agreement amount. The approach actually allows building owners to finance a project based on the savings achieved, and the capital costs are paid using those savings. So once the term is complete, the building owner keeps 100% of the savings, and they own the equipment, but it's not an asset or an obligation on their balance sheet. We really like this method because it also relies on ample measurement and verification, in our case, over a 10 year period. Measurement and verification is key to achieving targets and striving for continuous improvement. As they say, you can't, imagine, you can't manage what you don't measure.
So now I just want to dive into an overview of the retrofit measures. Um, so first of all, we looked at the domestic hot water and space heating systems. We also looked at the ventilation, interior and exterior lighting, and we also worked on the, the water systems with the low flow toilets. I'm gonna to touch on a few of these points in more depth in the coming slides. So for domestic hot water and space heating systems. Uh, first, um, this is a really important area with lots of opportunities for improvement as these systems generally account for two thirds of energy use in a multi-unit -res residential building. We replaced older atmospheric boilers, some of which were over 30 years old with high efficiency condensing boilers. Not only do older boilers not have modulating capability, they're often dramatically oversized. This leads to wasted heat and uncomfortable tenants. When the boiler replacements are done, people might be tempted to just bring in the same size boiler, but what we've seen is that through a thorough design process, we can really quantify the actual heating load of the building and often the heating capacity can be reduced. Uh, some buildings had had their boilers replaced more recently, so wherever possible, we wanted to keep those and recommission them, but they're only used for peak loads. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight was introducing in-suite controls through smart thermostats. So this was a really exciting piece of our project because we were able to introduce suite level control for residents for the first time. This helped again to curb the overheating that we saw, it improved indoor environmental quality, and it also gave residents more autonomy over their space. So ventilation is another key area that has a number of impacts both on energy and indoor environmental quality. Of course, good ventilation is critical to removing moisture and contaminants from the air. So in our projects, where necessary, makeup air units were replaced with newer units, particularly if the old unit had been found to be non-functioning for some time. We also introduced variable frequency drives with scheduling capability to help conserve energy during periods of low occupancy while maintaining maximum ventilation during the evening when people were cooking or bathing. And duct cleaning was found to be another really essential measure that should be built into every building's maintenance plan. You can see the difference it makes just from the before and after photos shown here. Tenants also provided a lot of positive feedback on the improved ventilation and decreased odor infiltration from neighboring suites after the duct cleaning. In terms of water measures, um, although water is not directly tied to energy efficiency, it makes up another important aspect of our projects. Switching from si six liter toilets to three liter low flow toilets has resulted in significant water savings, lowering operating costs and outperforming our targets. In other projects, we've also done things such as retrofitting shower heads and kitchen and bathroom sinks. It's great when you can reduce domestic hot water use through aerators and low flow fixtures because that can also provide some natural gas savings. So now let's take a look at the project outcomes, specifically the resource savings we were able to achieve. We reduced total building electricity consumption by 19%. We also reduced total building gas consumption by 24%. And lastly, as I mentioned, we reduced water consumption by an astounding 29%. We saved over 53,000 cubic meters of water. That's enough to fill the Ripley's Aquarium tanks 10 times over every year. And if we take a look at the project financials, the seven building retrofit was really quite viable. Our net present value was just over $6.8 million with a simple payback of 7.9 years and the return on investment was 364%. When targeting 30% emission reductions, the saving case can be quite significant. These retrofits were an excellent investment for Toronto community housing, saving them just over $500,000 in utility costs annually. However, the business case does become a bit more challenging when we approach deeper retrofits, and this is where funding mechanisms and support can really help out. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to touch on is the emissions reductions. So in this particular retrofit, 895 tons of carbon emissions were saved across all three sites. This is equivalent to removing 178 cars from the road every year. This was a 22% emissions reduction. While this didn't meet our internal goal of 30% uh, emission reductions across the portfolio, we are still able to satisfy the client's goal of 20% or more in cost savings. 
And the challenges that we faced um, really highlight the importance of ongoing measurement and verification, as well as building commissioning. Through continuous commissioning efforts, we are confident to improve in future years, and we'll hopefully meet the emissions goals that we set out. So some thoughts on the scale of potential um, based on everything that I've just discussed. If we were performing similar retrofits on a multi on all multi-residential buildings in the GTHA, we could reduce emissions by 800 kilotons. This could be done for many buildings at a near-term profit today. And if we instead did deep energy retrofits of these buildings, what we would define as 40% reductions or more, we could um, reduce emissions by at least 1.5 megatons, which is nearly 7% of the GTHA's total building emissions. So now I'll turn the presentation back over to Keith, who will discuss the co-benefits of energy efficiency retrofits and the pathway to scale. Thanks, Caitlin. <clears throat> so the benefits of energy efficiency retrofits shouldn't be limited to just energy and cost savings. It's equally important to recognize and design for additional benefits from the projects, and we like to call these co-benefits. These co-benefits can be benefits to public health through improved indoor environmental quality and decreased emissions and pollution from reductions in fossil fuel consumption, the benefit of local job creation, reduced maintenance, and uh, improving the resilience of our buildings. <clears throat> the potential for dramatically improving the indoor environmental quality for residents is one of the reasons that TAF has focused on retrofits in the social housing sector. These projects can reduce energy consumption and simultaneously address capital renewal and deferred maintenance issues. And the cost savings from the operational cost savings from the retrofits can free up capital for social housing providers to make other pressing repairs. Let me provide a couple of examples of other co-benefits that we designed for in this particular retrofit. So indoor environmental quality, there's often a preconceived notion that energy efficiency comes at the cost of comfort, and this should never be the case. Improving indoor environmental quality, including the factors that influence resident health and comfort should be held as key outcomes of any energy efficiency retrofit. Um, we conducted pre and post retrofit surveys, uh, resident surveys, as part of this project. And this is something we like to do in all of our projects. We really like to get some qualitative feedback from residents to help us understand how the retrofit affected them. In this case, retrofit, the residents told us that over 80% um, of the residents pre retrofit indicated that they opened their windows in the winter before the retrofit was done. And this was also verified by on-site surveys of windows open. After the retrofit, uh, this decreased by almost 40%. We also asked residents how often they felt too hot or too cold or just right in their suites. And we saw a 27 and 37% drop in reports of residents feeling too hot at the two sites where we introduced in-suite smart thermostats. And not only did the smart thermostats reduce winter overheating and improve comfort, we estimate that they saved somewhere between five and 10% of all the gas consumed uh, in those buildings for space heating. Another clear benefit from this project is the creation of local jobs. The Canadian Green Building Council's Trading Up report, which looked at capacity gaps in the building industry, predicts that 80,000 new recruits will be needed in the retrofit trades in Canada by 2026. And providing local jobs and building the high skill construction workforce that we need in the future are significant benefits of retrofits. The Institute for Market Transformation estimates that there are 13.4 jobs created for every 1 million invested in multi-residential retrofits. And this is actually a quite a conservative number. If you look at different studies, um, most of the studies have uh, more jobs created per million dollar than this. In this project, we provided nearly 1,700 hours of employment to local residents through an organization called Building Up. Uh, it's a Toronto-based social contractor. Um, Building Up provides housing providers with skilled laborers from the local community. And their goals are to improve the efficiency of Toronto's built environment while providing real pathways uh, to employment in the construction industry for individuals experiencing uh, barriers. It's one of, of one of many similar organizations across North America, and there's almost certainly one operating uh, wherever you happen to be right now. 
And retrofit projects can require the use of social contractors like building up as part of the procurement process. Our own RFPs, we require proponents to provide employment opportunities to those facing barriers. And you know, we're flexible on how this can be done. We do recommend the use of social enterprises because they have those built-in connections to the community. So not surprisingly, our recommendations for, uh, for retrofit programs, they follow our own approach to retrofits. Some general principles we like to follow, um, avoid shallow retrofits and encourage participation by minimizing barriers for building owners. And specifically, um, consider centralizing services via a one-stop shop or a hub or whatever you want to call it, um, but try to make the process as simple as possible from the owner, from the perspective of the building owner. Guide them through the, the retrofit process as much as possible and treat them as a customer that you want to keep for the long term. Also, focus on whole buildings and multi-measure retrofits instead of just individual technologies or measures. Treat buildings as systems. And set minimum performance targets for participation in a program. Uh, in the project described here, we were looking for a 30% emission reduction target, but I'd say somewhere in the 25 to 30% range might be a good minimum threshold for participation in a program. And once that threshold is set, you can build incentives to encourage participants to go deeper by providing more grant funding, for example, or lower interest rates. And for those retrofits that aren't particularly deep, um, we recommend future-proofing investments by following a long-term retrofit plan. And the plan can be used to guide the building owner in the future, even after this, the first initial retrofit is done. And it will help ensure that the investments that are made today will not become stranded assets tomorrow. In the retrofit that Caitlin just described, the design team selected modulating boilers that were appropriately sized to allow for efficient operation in the future uh, when later envelope retrofits were done and heating demand would be reduced. It was a consideration in this retrofit. And then also uh, set reasonable timelines that allow for flexibility and provide sufficient time for integrated project delivery. This applies to both the application process and uh, project delivery timelines. So short application timelines, they will limit participation to those projects that are pretty fairly well developed and probably wouldn't have happened anyway. And if you have short project delivery timelines, you're going to limit project scope um, and you're going to discourage the use of integrated project delivery. Also, uh, promote additionality, or another way to look at this is to try to prevent free riders in your program. Most of the items I described in that last slide, the minimum thresholds, flexible timelines, minimum performance targets, they help ensure that projects would not have happened without the existence of the program. Ideally, building owners are participating because of the program and not simply taking advantage of grants or low cost capital for a project that they were going to do anyway. We also recommend that you measure carbon and use it to set performance targets instead of or in addition to energy. Our goal is to reduce emissions, so let's measure emissions. And finally, ensure that retrofits are performing as designed through a robust measurement and verification process. Modeled emission reductions are not emission reductions. Um, we also strongly recommend going beyond standard MNV by ensuring a year of optimization commissioning as part of the services that are delivered uh, with a retrofit. It's not unusual for equipment uh, is requ to require optimization and tweaking over that first year of, uh, of performance, the first year of operation. Um, you can help ensure the success of the retrofit by uh, measuring performance, getting feedback from residents and site staff, and optimizing equipment in that first year. On the financial side of things, encourage deep energy retrofits by combining grants with attractive financing. There may not be a strong business case for deep retrofits today, but by supplementing attractive financing with grants, uh, that can help, can help boost the business case. Um, and the amount of the grant can be tied to performance uh, with larger grants for projects that target deeper retrofits. So really incentivizing those deeper retrofits, as I mentioned earlier. And you know, keep in mind that financing is an important tool, but it's not a retrofit program by itself. Low cost capital alone will not provide the additionality we're looking for or the scale we're looking for in a retrofit program. We've seen that time and time again. 
financing alone will not produce scale. And uh, also financing should be optional for those participants who don't want or need it. Uh, try not to limit the pool of potential retrofit candidates by requiring the use of program financing. Um, some private building owners, for example, may have ac access to, to low cost capital and may not want to take program financing. So don't, don't uh, exclude them. And then consider mechanisms for providing capital when it's needed, which is to say at the beginning of the project or at stages through the project. If a program is only providing capital at the end of a project, uh, then you're going to limit participation to building owners who have ready access to capital and are willing to use it. So again, don't limit the potential pool of uh, participants. And then consider different financing mechanisms and provide options to participants if that's possible. Some examples, um, financing could be repaid via local improvement charges uh, where the loan is repaid through the property tax bills and stays with the, the property. Um, uh, Loans can be repaid via utility on bill financing, energy savings agreements, low interest loans, or ideally some combination of these. We actually uh, recently spoke with a representatives from a municipality in the GTHA uh, that's developing a residential retrofit program more focused on single family homes. But it was great to see that they've incorporated many of these same ideas into their program. They're planning to centralize services as much as possible because they know they need to do that to get homeowners to participate. They're providing flexible financing options, including repayment via local improvement charges, and they're offering bundles of multi-measure retrofits um, and will create incentives to try to get uh, participants to go deeper. And they will also require access to utility data in order to do their own uh, measurement and verification on the projects. It was really exciting to see. So quickly, just to summarize, um, we need to dramatically increase the scale of retrofits in order to meet our necessarily aggressive climate targets. Uh, successful retrofits generate benefits that go well beyond energy and cost savings. These benefits include health benefits to residents and the general public, improvements in resilience, improved comfort for residents, local job creation, and of course, there are the climate benefits. And we need well-designed retrofit programs to realize these benefits and to scale up retrofits. Scale, especially for deep energy retrofits with challenging business cases, will not be generated without programs that help guide participants through what is a very complex and painful process. Retrofit programs should centralize services as much as possible, minimize free riders, incentivize deep retrofits, measure operational performance and optimize it, and provide financing options that are flexible and that put the participant first. So we hope you found this webinar useful and that it might inform some future or existing retrofit programs. Here at TAF, we're exploring how we can scale up our own retrofit program and our recommendations here come from our ongoing work in this space. If you'd like to learn more, we've we published three case studies on the Toronto Community Housing Retrofits on our website, uh, TAF at CA, so please go check those out. Um, and we're continually publishing results on our retrofits, so if you want to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter, that would be fantastic. Thank you for listening, and don't hesitate to reach out to us for more information or if you have any questions.